the topic at, at hand in intense work is rest and the, the phrase that you put into um, into the title for today's chat. Do you mind giving um, just the background on, on that phrase and why it's one of your favorite phrases within Vedanta to talk about? Sure. So a hundred and something years ago, gosh, 120 years ago, uh, Ramatirtha, the great Swami of North India, uh, was in America <clears throat> lecturing or, or ma- mainly in the, the West Coast. I don't even, I don't think he got East, but anyway, he was an uh, amazing, self-realized soul, um, incredibly influential to our guru, Swami Partsarthi. And um, he was, uh, uh, thankfully, one one lady followed him around the West Coast and took notes of everything he said. And we can now read all that, all those lectures in a seven volume set called In Woods of God Realization. Uh, and uh, Swami Ramatirtha at that time uh, was asked uh, by somebody, hey, how do I find peace and rest? amidst the uh, challenges of life and the stress of work, which is crazy that they were asking him that already 120 years ago. Um, but they were. And he he immediately looked at the guy and said, intense work is rest. So this is the, the background. And um, mm-hmm. uh, our teacher, Swamiji, has uh, really, really highlights this, this, phrase intense work is rest yeah yeah and so that's the background i remember here uh, echo man okay i'll try to do little talking today there we go nice don't know what happened but the uh we will make sure you're doing 90 percent of the talking today anyhow but the the phrase when i first heard it it reminded me of aristotle has a quote of uh, happiness is a being at w- a being in work in accordance with virtue and and just a definition of happiness from a western philosopher and synonymizing happiness with work in accordance with virtue the other thing that i thought about was someone really smart years ago mentioned to me that um even in the the book of genesis before the fall there was work in the garden and work was very much a part of paradise. And so you take these three things, intense work is rest. You uh, take Plato's definition of happiness of being at work in accordance with virtue. And the fact that um, there was in the, the great capital in mythology of the book of Genesis, you've got work being a part of paradise. And you contrast that to, exactly what you already touched on where today and sounds like 120 years ago we synonymize work with stress and strain and and distraction from life that's why we say work life balance as if work is this thing that you must feed so that you can live and so it all comes to this uh this head in my in my mind where it seems like there is work that dissipates energy that we're all familiar with. And then there's this other type of work that I'm excited about chatting with you today and what it is and helping give it some shape that can actually generate energy like resting. And in fact, maybe even more so than, than resting. So first let's start on what is the work that dissipates energy? Right. So, uh, and just to uh, go along with what you're saying, uh, yes, there is this idea that work is tiring, that work is is somehow something that uh, we just have to get through um, and then get on to our real life sort of thing, which is fairly absurd because if, if for most of us, most people spend most of their time working. So if we're just all the time waiting to live later, um, that's a whole lot of life wasted and, um, unlived. And many times we never actually get to that, um, 
that that stage outside of work. Everything is work. You come home from work, you do chores. Those are work. You finish your chores, then you go, you know, and constantly looking forward to vacations, uh, Friday evenings, the weekends, uh, et cetera, um, as the time where we can actually uh, enjoy and, and live fully. So um, that that is a, a great misconception. If you can't find peace in action, you will never find it because human beings are constantly mm. active. So it's within the action, it's within the work that is where we are to find our peace, our rest, our bliss. So anyway, just to, to agree yeah. with what you're saying. Um, the kind of work, to answer your question, that is agitating or that is, that is, so, that is energy depleting is that which is agitated, which is, is full of desire, which is, is full of stress which um, has concern for the fruits of the action, which has over excitement in the present or worry about it, or is, is attached to the action from the past. So the, the personality has plenty of energy, more than enough, you know, more that we have, we see children running around um, with tons and tons of energy. Um, Elle doesn't come home from school and need a rest. You know, she, she runs around uh, with more energy, right? To get to school, there's tons of energy because children do not yet have worries of the past, anxiety for the future, or over involvement in the present. Um, when, we, indeed, when we do, yeah. we do nightly, nightly dinner questions, of, questions of, and there's a little oh, echo. echo, but... Uh, but uh, when we do dinner questions of what was your favorite part of today, she always replies with, right now. And it's actually kind of sad and, and perverse that we're already training her to prefer certain moments other over others, to think back in the past, to pull the past forward, to reflect on uh, you know, something that is no longer there, taking her out of the, the now. But she's she is dutifully reminding us that um, the now seems to be all we have. But she always says, "Right now." That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, as you said rightly, work done in the classical way of working, in the classical way of of action that is recommended by Vedanta, should actually create energy, not deplete it. Um, this is the 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 first sort of test of of whether we are working in in the in the classically recommended way. If we are refreshed, if we are rejuvenated, if we are recreated by our action, work or otherwise, um, then it is then we are acting properly. It should give us energy. Uh, it seems contradictory, but not really. You go to the gym for what? So that you have more energy. You, you, you feel more energized, you feel refreshed, recreated by exercise. So acting in, in the correct way should give energy, not deplete energy. And that which depletes the energy is um, uh, the worries of the past and anxieties of the future. In other words, selfishness, ego for me and mine. Um, and therefore, the uh, the method to get out of that problem, to start creating energy, is to drop the worries of the past, drop the anxieties for the future, drop the overexcitement about it in the present, and plunge into action. Swamiji famously from the stage, you know, has been yelling to the crowd for 10, 60 years, clip the past, clip the future, plunge into the present, <laughs> you know. An act, um, you know, which is is a co pretty common theme now. But as with everything, um, those those sort of platitudes are kind of usually stop there. The uniqueness of Vedanta and what it has to offer is how to do it, and what the actual mechanism is to plunge into that uh, present. It's you say platitude. 
you know, 20 years ago before Oprah raving of books like The Power of Now, it, it was quite revolutionary to think that fear and anxiety and pain, they exist in the past and the future, but not in the present. It was, I remember when I first read that book and feeling like it was a revolutionary thought. And so, but I'm glad that it's reached platitudinal status societally yeah. where we've heard it so often now in the last 20 years. But, but I, do you mind going further into one, um, what you mean by those not existing in the present? And then two, how do you pragmatically use that in life and not just say, oh yeah, that's okay. It might not exist, but I'm feeling crazily anxious. I'm feeling extremely fearful. Um, how do you actually go from words you hear someone say to tactically using it in, in one's life? Yeah, sure. But what did you say about not existing in the present? Yeah, the pain uh, or fear and anxiety. So uh, worries of the past, uh, anxiety of the future. Mm -hmm. um, those don't exist um, in the present if you can plunge into the present, as, as you say. Um, and, and oh, maybe yeah. they do correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds I like see. the plunge in plunge into the present means that's how you get away from them. Um, but going for do you mind explaining that further? And maybe I've, and where I might've gotten that wrong. And then also just say how it becomes, how it becomes tactical. Hi, L speaking of hell, I'll go, I'll go on mute as you, as you help me answer. I'll guide uh, L back to Janie. Sure. So, um, the, just to remind everybody that the inner equipments, the subtle body of the human being, there are two inner equipments, mind and intellect, manas and buddhi. Mind is the flowy stuff, the irrational stuff, the, um, emotional stuff, attachments, desires, all that. Not bad. It's just, that's what it is. The intellect is the thinking, reasoning, judging, focusing capacity uh, within us, the reasonable, rational piece of our inner inner being, our, our subtle body. So the nature of the mind is to uh, wander around. It's, it's like the water in the river. It has no inherent form. Uh, it has no inherent direction. It never says enough. So the nature of the mind, my mind, your mind, everybody's mind, is to wander into the past if it's not held in the, in the present by the intellect and to worry about what happened in the past or be attached to what happened to the, in the past, whatever, and to wander in, away from the present into the future, worrying about is, is, are we going to succeed? Is it going to be a, uh, are we going to get what we want? Am I going to you know, be secure, whatever it is in the future. That's the nature of the mind. So the present by itself is naturally peaceful, restful, full of energy. The mind pulls, when the mind pulls the personality into the past, it's a dissipation of energy. Oh, it's a waste. The past is fait accompli. It's dead. It's over. It's gone. Not that we can't stop and rationally analyze the past and learn from our past life that's useful but it should be led by the intellect not by the mind just being allowed to dissipate the energy into the past likewise yes, the that, mind, that, that yeah. phrase do you mind going deeper which of how, of how the intellect uh -huh. versus the mind would dive into the past and maybe reflect and learn but the differences between uh, one or the other yeah, sure. So if we notice something in our past is feels like we haven't processed it or whatever, we haven't uh, fully integrated it, or, um, you know, it's something that, you know, you're missing from the past or whatever, there could be something there that's worth stopping to analyze. But the intellect should be like, okay, uh, can tell the mind, okay, mind, you're worrying about whatever happened last week. Uh, here's on make a note in your calendar that this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, I'll sit down and analyze what happened last week and put it to bed. That's fine. But the intellect should lead it. And then it's very powerful. The in, then when the mind is starting to do it again, the intellect's like, listen, I told you we're going to do it this afternoon. You got to almost talk to yourself. You do have to talk to yourself. You know, uh, 
we've got to learn to lecture to ourselves. And so then when it's time for the intellect to sit down and learn from what happened in the past, you sit down, you pull up that file from the past, and you analyze it and to the bottom of it, figure it out, come to a conclusion, learn your lesson, and be done. Or if you're like, I still don't really know what that is, um, then put it on the shelf. But don't allow the personality to keep on going into the past. And it's just a dissipation of energy. We have plenty of energy, infinite energy, in fact, if we're really in the present. That allows us to focus, but if we're if we're in the zone, everyone knows that experience. You talk about flow state a lot, so that that is the ability to stay in the present. And you have all this extra energy. You feel like you're you know ahead of the mind. The mind isn't uh, in any way victimizing you. And then if but if we allow it to go into the past, it dissipates. So the intellect has to be alert to get in the habit of learning first of all what is my mind. What is my intellect? First step, huge step. And when you're really clear on that, you will understand, oh, it's my mind that is enslaving me. It is my mind that is victimizing me. It is my mind that is terrorizing my peace and my my sleep and my energy. So I don't want to be the slave of my mind anymore, right? And so uh, you see it happening and you, you do like the exercise I told you. You can literally make a note. Be like, we'll, we, will, we will worry about that later <laughs> with the intellect uh, in charge of the exercise. And same thing with the future. If the mind is constantly going into the future, worried about whether or not we're going to reach a certain goal or target or success or security or whatever it is or other people, or what's going to happen to the world is, are we going to go to nuclear war, whatever it is, bothering everybody about the future. Same thing with the intellect can stop and analyze it out of existence, that worry, that that over uh, concern about the future. All of these exercises bring you back to what you want to be doing in the present moment, with all of your energy, with all of your mental resources, and you will have a, you will have all of it and to spare. Because there is, there is more than enough. As going back to the example of the child, the children have such these tiny bodies. They have so many fewer calories than us. And they, they can't sit still. They just want to walk around. You know, they want to do stuff. They want to pick stuff up constantly. Tons of energy. Because they are not limited yet by worries of the past, anxieties of the future. It's just dormant in them. It will come. It happens to everybody. And adults have so much more calories, physical energy, so much more mental resources, so much more of every everything. And yet we're tired. We need to sit down all day. We're exhausted. By allowing our mind to tear us apart in multiple directions. That is the definition of stress. Stress is mental agitations caused by unfulfilled desires in the mind. So the more we entertain all of these irrational desires and and, uh, let it pull us in every direction, worries, anxieties, all that, the the less energy we'll have uh, in the present. And it takes, number one, understanding what the personality is, which is a huge thing. And number two, uh, learning to apply the intellect constantly, constantly keeping our hands on the steering wheel of the personality. Could you give an example of the narrative in our minds with um, when the when the mind is in control, the internal narrative, I shouldn't say in our minds, but that internal narrative when the mind is in control of, of let's say, just the work someone might be doing today on a Friday and in the seven meetings that they've got coming up later today when the mind is in control and then when the intellect is in control and in contrast. Yeah. So the problem is that when the mind is in control, we're not, we don't know the mind is in control. There's no narrative. That's the problem. When the mind takes over the part of you that is objective enough to uh, know what's happening is, is overwhelmed. So you become the worry, you become the anxiety of the mind. 
it's irrational. It, there, there's no, of course, there's some intellect. I mean, if, if it's totally mind, that's insanity. You know, if you, if you see somebody on the street, you know, yelling at the sky and, you know, whatever, who's insane, that person is completely lost to their mind. There's no intellect at all. But it happens to all of us relatively. So to the extent that we are uh, overwhelmed by the mind, we will not know it. We will only feel like, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm stressed out, I'm agitated, I don't know why, right? Because the intellect has lost control a, mm -hmm. a while back. Um, this is the problem. Uh, the moment you become aware of, hey, my mind is just going back into this thing that happened two years ago for no reason. And the moment you're aware of it, half the battle is solved, you know? Uh, and then, then at that point, the intellect has to stop and analyze and understand it and apply reason to it and all these higher values and knowledge that we're studying in Vedanta to uh, dissolve that thing out of existence, whatever that, whatever that is. Um, when the intellect is is in control of the narrative, is creating the, the, um, the guardrails for our actions, there is peace, there is energy, there is focus on the work per se. So it's like, okay, you want to cook a meal, you know, so all that's going on in that person's mind is take out the broccoli, get the beans ready, get your nutritional yeast, get out the bread and heat up the cheese. I'm describing my dinner last night. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It just, it just right. focus on what you're doing, you know? You'll, you'll be focused on what you're doing. There will be no worry of the past, no anxiety of the future. You will be self-oblivious. You won't even be aware of yourself. Also, the other thing that disturbs us is I am doing this. So if there's there's a uh, if there's a lot of uh, if there's as much focus on hey I'm doing this, uh, and then that also dissipates from the action. So when you are really in the zone, as it were, in the flow state, what have you, that the work alone exists at that point. You are not you are not even conscious of yourself. Right. Right. And and this is the abs this is the rest. This is the piece. This is all, by the way, chapter 3, verse 30 of the Bhagavad Gita. Swamiji calls it the blueprint of right action. That one verse. He says if there's one verse in the Gita, that's the verse. You know? Do you mind reciting about... it? Uh, sure, yeah. So, let me just pull out the book. With flow state um, and, and the conventional definition of it, it is there's a lack of emotion and a lack of register of, of the self the uh, individual and whether it's basketball or whether it's art um, or whether it's running for folks that have been in it it is you're right it's just the work at hand it is this um, this 12 inch ball going into a 24 inch hoop and that's it and that's all you see uh, in one of the most profound things about it is that you you do not register yourself obviously i mean if you don't register your individualized self and you and you don't register the emotions the ego the past the fear the anxiety it's um yeah it's very much like flow state and it's incredibly energizing yeah for sure um Right. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, yesterday um, I was watching March Madness and uh, to your point, and uh, I forget what their name, Saint, somebody beat Kentucky yesterday, Saint, I can't even remember the name. It's like this tiny school in New Jersey with like 3000 kids, a great game. And at the end that they asked the coach of that team, they were, he was like just laughing and talking to the reporter, the, the winning coach. And the reporter asked him, she was like, so were you nervous? I mean, you're going up against Kentucky. And he was like, for what? It's just basketball. <laughs> All right. Great. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that we'll chat about here next is expectation. expectation.
and its role in uh, energy dissipating instead of intense work being rest. Yeah, so that's a, that's a part of this verse where all this knowledge comes from. Um, so, uh, renouncing all actions in me with thoughts resting on the self, free from hope and attachment, fight without mental fever. So, there's a ton there in this verse. It's, uh, again, uh, verse 30, chapter 3 of the Gita. Swamiji calls it the blueprint of, of an ideal action. So, uh, there, as we said, there are two things required, the, well, uh, two things to know about an action. One is that it should create energy. And number two, it should not dissipate energy. These are the two sort of uh, baseline uh, litmus tests for whether our action is, is ideal and proper according to the Vedantic way of living. The, in, the action should create energy. It should not dissipate energy. That's number one. So then this verse says, renouncing all actions in me with thoughts resting on the self, fight. So these are the three points I want to talk about now. At the level of the body, you are active. That's what the word fight is about. You're dynamic. I, action, our lives should be dynamic, full of action. Renouncing all actions in me. This refers to a surrender at the mental level, at the level of the mind, a surrender to a higher ideal. With thoughts resting on the self. That's talking about the intellect's role of focusing the personality on the higher ideal. So at the level of the body, the first part of the verse is saying, we need to be dynamic, action, action-oriented, always prone towards action. The more we act, the more energy we have. The more we try to get away from action, the less energy we will have. Renouncing all actions in me talks about the surrender at the level of the heart, at the level of the mind. There's a devotional approach, a surrender towards a higher ideal. And intellectually, the, the, the orientation of the personality is kept in that direction by the intellect. So... In this verse, it's talking about the self, the divinity, the truth. That's the highest. And when you do that, you'll have the most energy. But it could be that you want to focus on the higher ideal of the best thing for your company or the best thing for your nation or the best thing for your family. So you focus on that with your intellect, whatever that higher ideal is. That's the crux of this whole uh, method is to have a clear higher ideal fixed by the intellect. And then you surrender to it, meaning your mind bows down to it. It stops with its doubting Thomas kind of endless uh, uncertainty at the level of the mind. And these two are obviously related. The intellect helps the mind surrender. The surrender of of the mind helps the intellect be sharp and clear. You've got to feel what you understand, understand what you feel. And And the body's got to be acting constantly in that direction, which is so ironic because... We constantly think of spirituality or we think of the Bhagavad Gita or all this Vedanta as for people that are inactive, that are sitting in caves doing nothing. Right. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. It's a, it is a path of, of dynamic action. So this is the first part of the verse. Go ahead, James. Yeah, that's, there's two things that I want to ask you about. One is, is it, can you say that just noticing that your action is dissipating your energy, whatever you're doing, whether it's your job or whether it is uh, the task you're you're working on, if it's dissipating your energy, is that the telltale sign that it is, uh, as you'd say, as incorrect action, is in the wrong direction? Right, it's one of them. Uh, sure. So if we're constantly exhausted, if we're constantly uh lacking enthusiasm if we have less energy more and as we move through our work uh as as it goes on as we get further into it it means as you very correctly said that the direction is wrong it means we're not functioning for a higher ideal so if we're not functioning for a higher ideal what are we functioning for our own selfishness Hmm. so uh 
this is the difference between initiative and incentive. When you're functioning for a higher purpose, you gain energy by that purpose. You gain dynamism. You gain a taste. You want to do more work. You want to do more action. You are recreated by it. You find you find purpose and peace and bliss in the action when you're functioning for a higher ideal. But when you're functioning for yourself, your action becomes less and less and less satisfying for the same amount of result. So they have to keep giving more incentives to get people to do the same amount of work rather than give people a cause to fight for. And then you don't need uh, incentives. People are from within. They're inspired to work. You understand. And you can see this. There are companies uh, that are that have inspired in, inspired people working for them. Everybody wants to work for those companies. There's a different culture versus those that are just uh, cutthroat, you know, all about the the quarterly reviews and the of each other and com competitive and this bonus and that bonus people burn out from all that stuff and are exhausted and stressed they don't it, it, the the same the same hundred thousand dollar bonus produces fifty percent less work than the next year and twenty percent mm -hmm. the, the year after that because selfishness is agitating selfishness ego based living is agitating. In addition to the fact that uh, everything has diminishing value, so the initiative way of functioning is for a higher ideal, set by the intellect, surrendered to by the mind, and pursued by constant and dynamic action at the body. An additional component is you end up doing more. It requires more and more of you. With I know in building companies, and working at companies building companies with a hundred employees or working at Airbnb with 5,000 employees, if you're, if the project at hand is a selfish one, two months later, three months in, five months in, you end up, you end up having to do more and more to keep it going versus uh, the ones, the folks taking on an unselfish project of, hey, this just needs to get, get done. No one's doing it. So I'm going to jump on the landmine and, and tackle this big task. And after four weeks, it's almost like our communities, they sense that selfishness and there's an aversion from you and your work versus the, the community that senses the, I mean, everyone knows the neighbor that is unselfish and how cherished they are, the coworker that's unselfish on the team of 13 or 35 people. And the whole company, the whole team, the whole company knows, reveres, loves, as you say, bows down to like, what a, there's a, a friend Lenny at Airbnb that he was just like that on our team of hundreds of people. And it just, it was just like whatever makes Lenny happy because he's so confident. He's so unselfish and he does a lot of the dirty work that others uh, shy away from. And, and then ends up, you know, he has five, 10, 15 people rallying around him to help him out, wanting to be on his team. And it's ends up being, the other most competent people. And so three weeks in, three months in, he's doing less work, you know, per unit of time. Um, and probably more fulfilled, more in a groove than than I know I've found myself at times where a lot of the work I'm doing is is ego engineering, is financial engineering, is is self you know, lowercase s self engineering. And and it ends up having this uh this opposite effect, this repulsive effect to those around us um, because it's, you know, humans are smart. We pick up on that. Uh, is it initiative for a cause or is it incentive for some reward? So, yeah, I, I definitely felt it in life. Do you mind? And and one of the other things that you touched on was that this, this conventional idea we have of spirituality, of, of being in, you know, seated in lotus position, um, not working, not active, not in, not uh, a part of uh, community and work, and yet we already touched on uh, Aristotle's definition of happiness being a being at work in accordance with virtue, and and Ramatirtha's response of intense work is rest when in accordance with these higher values. It uh, reminds me of you telling me uh, years ago, Buddha. The statue of Buddha should be him walking, 
not him sitting. Um, do you mind telling uh, folks in the room why why you said that to me? Yeah, so it's it's that same idea, you know. Um, everyone has statues of Lord Buddha in their garden, um, despite the fact that he said never make statues of me, but that's okay. Um, and <laughs> the the statues are all wrong. Uh, yes, he spent he spent years uh, yeah, in the jungle, uh, but he was learning. He was studying. He was like in the lab. It's not that he just went and sat under a tree for the, his life. That's not at all what happened. He was, he was learning. He was serving his gurus. He was highly active. And yes, for some small portion of, of some few years of his his life, he actually sat still with his eyes closed until he attained nirvana. Correct. But after that, what did he do? He walked around India for decades and decades and decades, preaching and teaching and sharing the Dharma. But that's not what we are attracted to. We're not attracted to the fact that he worked seven days a week for the rest of his life. You know, our guru Swamiji, I, I've never, I've known him for 25 years. There's never been a day where it's like, where's Swami? Oh, he's on, he took the day off. Mm. He took a vacation today. Like it's inconceivable. It, it, every morning, every day of that man's life, every minute of his life is constant service to everybody else. And therefore he's the most peaceful, the most free, the most dynamic, the most energetic of everybody at 94 years old, the sharpest. And mm -hmm. because it's constant work. I mean, the ashram that, that we go visit in India where I've studied is seven days a week, 365, 4 a.m. till 9 p.m. No weekends, no vacations, no breaks because it's not needed simply because it's not required because everybody's inspired. Everybody's inspired by this higher ideal and wants to dissolve themselves in it. You know, Swamiji has been serving that for 60 years. Lord Buddha served that for years. And years. Ramatirtha was constantly active. All these great masters. So I don't know where humanity has gotten the idea that spirituality means getting away from everything. I'm going on a 10-day retreat to do nothing. Why are people doing it? Because they're tired. Because they're stressed out. They should take a break, actually. But don't do it in the name of spirituality. Just go to Club Med or whatever, you know? Mm. The problem is that people have conflated these things, that spirituality is, is doing nothing, that spirituality is getting away from action. Even in India, the Bhagavad Gita is considered what you read after you're retired, which is horrible. It's a manual for life. It's a manual for uh, dynamic people to learn how to live. What's the point of reading the manual after you're about to sell the appliance? What's mm. the point of reading the manual of life when you're about to kick it and go to the next life, you know? Uh, so Swami puts up billboards all over India whenever he he doesn't put them up. We put them up, you know. But he's when he's going to do a big lecture series, you'll see billboards around India that says Bhagavad Gita is not a retirement plan. Because India's got this really bad misconception that Bhagavad Gita is what you read after retirement, which makes no sense. It's all about action and dynamism and doing our duties and how to do them peacefully. So uh, that's that's why I mentioned that uh, whenever that was about about the Buddha. We the thing is, we are tired, we are stressed, we are fatigued, we do lack energy, and we do need weekends and vacations. We're not saying everybody should stop weekends and vacations. You you do need it, but we only need it because we're not living properly. If we were living properly, we wouldn't need it. Did Martin Luther King Jr. take take days off? I don't think so. Even mm -hmm. his 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 Sundays, I'm sure, in some way were work. Did Gandhi ever take days off? For what? These these are these are extreme examples of inspired people. They don't they don't need it. You understand? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the moment you get inspired by a, a goal beyond your self centered interests, you will find energy. You will find. You, you are interested in action. You will find that you are looking forward to work. You will find enthusiasm, which, by the way, will produce success. Because as you said about Lenny, who I remember from your – you had him on the podcast. is great mm -hmm. on your Below the Line podcast. You, the moment that you have a guy like that, everybody th – there will be work. There will be action and there will be success. I know that guy is extremely successful from listening. 
So obviously the whoever the person is who gets inspired to serve the company, the family, the community, whatever, they will be picked up and put on top and and uh, highly successful. Why is that so hard for us to believe that it, if, if I'm not looking out for myself? Yeah. <laughs> that uh, I'm going to be left behind. Yeah, just because it's it's unknown, right? So we fear that. It's it's not that we, it's it's not that we can't understand it. It's just fear of the unknown. We're so taught that you got to get yours. Nobody's going to do it for you. If you don't get it for yourself, you're going to be on the street or whatever. The society is so scared about what's going to happen to me, and that's the whole vibe of the culture these days. That you know, step on each other to get to get to the top. There's such a selfishness in in every bit of the culture in the way that even how these. This, none of this is taught in business school. This is what should be taught in business school, you know? And so we don't know it. And because we don't know that, even though it's it's hiding in plain sight, even though it's right in front of us, we don't know it. And, and so uh, there's nobody reading these scriptures and this knowledge and getting this information. Uh, so it's something, it's unknown and you, you fear the unknown. It makes us scared. So we're like, no, but what will happen to me? That that ego right, just right. sneaks in and 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 finds its way. It's it's pernicious, you know. It is, I think it's so accurate. Fear of the unknown makes us cling to the known, which is I'm driving this train and I, I I'm going to help others, but I'm going to make sure that I get to my destination as well because there's just there is no train that drives itself, and yet. Who would choose being in the pilot's seat going to India for 22 hours versus being in first class, chilling, resting, relaxing, um, and not having to be in control of every little aspect? It's, I mean, it's, it's the perfect metaphor is surfing, where it doesn't take too many waves before you realize, wow, okay, I paddle a little bit, some intense work, then catch the wave, and you don't have to do anything. The universe is quite literally every aspect of the physics, the bathymetry, the, uh, the sport just takes over, and you, you glide. Um, and yet with our work in the real world, we think, we think it's uh, there are no waves to catch that do the work for us, which is what we're talking about. The community picking you up and saying, this person is invaluable because they are the rare individual that works unselfishly. So we're going to carry them forward. And I say Lenny doing less work um, three weeks under three months in. It's, you know, and that I, I misspoke. It's the reality was once he got a project going, then he would have people just draft behind wanting to work with him wanting to work on that problem. And then he would take on more. It probably was a very consistent level of, of effort yet it had, you know, the universe conspiring with him instead of every one of us knows uh, the example of the egoistic, uh, selfish coworker where you, you just know anything that they kind of take on or want to take on. There's going to be kind of uh, the universe or the team around them. Just saying, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think we want to work with this person. I don't think this person deserves the resources that they're requesting. I don't think that uh, they're going to get the the best, most competent team members to join them uh, on whatever whatever uh, project they're working on. Okay, so to round this out, and then uh, Q and A for anyone that has questions on this paradoxical concept of intense work is rest. Um, what is the type of work? How can we this Friday morning, we listen to this and we say, shit, I think I'm, I'm enduring a lot of uh, stressful and energy dissipating work. I'm not catching that wave. How, how can someone use this topic to find that energy generating work? Um, and where does that, uh, like, how do you just shift the rudder towards that as you listen to this today in a pragmatic practical today uh, lens as well as zooming out and kind of from that higher level um, over a lifetime. Yeah, sure. So um, 
the first half of the verse uh, that we just finished discussing is saying, identify a more unselfish motive. Find a larger circle of identification to serve doing what you're doing already. It's not that you have to suddenly figure out a way to, uh, you know, save the world or something. I mean, that's great if you're inspired, but, but it could just be doing exactly what you're doing now and trying to look at the motive for why am I doing what I'm doing and, and can I um, serve more of, of society, more of humanity, more beings with my same action than I currently am internally. That's, that's number one, which I think we've covered. Um, the highest of that is to serve your self-unfoldment, to serve your pursuit of self-realization, which sounds selfish again, but it's not because the, uh, the, that's the highest goal. The, the highest goal is completely dissolving your ego. And that, that is that if you get inspired by that ideal, continue doing whatever you're doing in your life, but for the sake of spiritual enlightenment, you will find tremendous energy. It, that to the, the, the larger, the more expansive your ideal, the more increased energy and enthusiasm you will have. These, that, that's the first part. And this is the first half of the verse that we were talking about. So the second half is actually a good answer to your question and, and really practical. The second half of the verse says, be free from hope and attachment and mental fever. So the Bhagavad Gita is telling us to be hopeless. <laughs> so not, not in the way that we think of it in a bad way, but hopeless in the sense do not allow the mental energies to be preoccupied with the fruits of your action. That's what it means by hope. Uh, do not also allow the mental energies to be exhausted or, or eaten up by over-excitement and involvement in the present. That's called juara, mental fever. Nor should we allow the mind to constantly be attached to the past while we're acting and that comes in various forms why why didn't i do better last week why didn't i make that basket oh i, I could have spoken so much better in that meeting you know why did i argue with my spouse at home whatever it is and that is is water under the bridge it's over and still the mind is going back and rehashing and losing energy to that in the past the other thing that comes from the past is the ego so the sense that I am doing this, it's called mama, that, that mama, that mindness. So that's where that all of that, you know, you start a new job, you're humble, you're a new role or whatever. And, and you're, you, you, you're humble. You're not, you have no past in it. You have a lot more energy and enthusiasm, but then you start saying things like, you know how long I've been working here. You know how long I've been doing this. Don't you know I'm an expert in this field? All of that ego and that I-ness comes from being attached to our past work. So let the past go, even if you've been very successful in the past. Clean, drop it, and plunge into the present. Otherwise, the past in that way also dissipates our energy. So the, the practical answer is how to practically do this. Identify a higher ideal that you can relate to that's either unselfish or selfless, and try to start reminding yourself and working towards that in all that you do. Number one, you'll, you'll instantly find more energy. Number two is the second part. Don't allow the mind's past uh, preoccupations or overexcitement in the present or craving for the fruits of your actions in the future. Don't allow those things while acting to suck our energy away from the action which is required to get what you want. This is the, the practical thing. If you do that, you'll have tons of energy. You'll have all of your attention. You'll have all of your resources in each action that you do. And success will be the automatic effect. What is success? Success is an effect. It's an effect. You can't make success. All you can do is make effect action make work make effort that's all that's all we have control over the effect is takes care of itself so if we are able to do this we'll be peaceful 
and prosperous. So I don't know what the heck anybody else, what, uh, what else anybody wants. Peace and prosperity, right? Yeah. There's with the, uh, talk to anyone that's quote unquote successful and either they figured this out or they're stressed out of their mind. It's, it is an effect. It is not a state. It's not a destination. Um, they're still just doing it. Uh, and, and yeah, there is, there's no, uh, of the people that I, the most successful people that I know from a conventional sense, a career professional sense, CEO of, of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, 10 hours a day, every day. It's, it is, there's, he might be worth, I think maybe 10 to $15 billion now. And there is no finish line that has, that has been achieved. There's no finish line. That's even probably in sight. Um, the, and you touched on something really interesting of, of finding work even right now in your current role that can be ener- energy generating. And it sparked the, the thought that it's, whenever I go into the unknown, the work gets more energy generating over time. Whenever I go into the known, the work, and this is just a hack, um, but it ends up ends up being helpful. When I'm going into the known, like let's say finish college, get grades to get into whatever, some uh, grad school, that is a known path. And my monkey mind will start to take in these expectations of what I expect of myself. It'll start to take in these fruits. Well, this is what I want to happen with whatever GPA, with getting into a grad school, getting into, you know, whether it's, it, it is being in a corporate culture and it's like, ah, I want to get this title. When it's in the known, my mind kind of runs amok of, of comparison and, and that being a thief of joy runs into the muck of, of expectation and Shakespeare said is the root of all heartache, but it's when I go into the unknown, creating a company where there is no track to compare to or into the unknown, creating this with you, a philosophy podcast. It's, this is a very sharp left turn to what I, what most people uh, know me for. And yet it is so energy generating, not because of a strong intellect being employed um, it's really just the setup was, I have no, ex- I have no idea what this is. There is no example of, uh, this is, this is not like any other podcast that I know. And it's, uh, by definition, there is no comparison point. And so instead of it being this, uh, act oriented around the fruits that I see on the other side, or that I saw someone else gather up on the other side, um, when I go into the unknown, same thing for serving the community. Um, when I find ways to serve the community, um, feeding the underhoused neighbors in our community, there's, there is no comparison track and I have no idea how it's going to go. And, um, I have no idea how I'm going to benefit from it. And, and that kind of hack of going into that unknown and the, micro or the macro scale of maybe starting a, a startup instead of joining a large company. It's um, that, that unknown tends to have a lot of energy generation within it. And it's just an observation um, for, for someone thinking about this today of how do I find more energy generating work, find work that is oriented into that unknown where you, uh, almost have to disconnect how I'm going to benefit from this. Um, and, and what would the fruits be? Okay. With that, we'll open up for uh, Q, open Q and a for anything Vedanta related, anything philosophical or, around the principles we chat about today or anything in previous replays or podcast episodes that people have, have um, listened to. And we did just cross a thousand people in the club yoga for your intellect. So, uh, kudos to everybody that has followed us. It's, uh, it's pretty wild. And then also uh, check out yfyi.co for all the, all the resources. 
Yeah, thanks, James. Um, yeah, for sure. Check out yfyi.co if you want to watch uh, James and I uh, on video, on YouTube, and talking that way. And Michael's up. What's up, Michael? Where you at, man? Hey, guys. I am cruising through Kentucky right now. Good, uh, All right. Good to be in contact with you. I'm in the car right now, so hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, it's cool. We hear the road, but it's all good. Okay. One question I've got for you that didn't come up today, I'm, I'm just kind of curious around the role of, of of karma within this idea of action, specifically um, referencing um, a couple points through Vedanta that, that say that we're not the doer of any action. I know there's a couple of examples that I've come across. And so if we're not the doer and the reaper of any action, um, what's the significance of the law of karma? Yeah, I thanks. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Go. I said I can expound on that if that doesn't make sense, but... No, it does. I think I got it. But if you don't mind muting while, I, while we answer just so that... Uh, yeah, uh, replays sure. a little clearer. Cool, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's a few things going on. There's a lot going on there <laughs> in your question. Uh, so yes, that 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 law of karma bit to start with is it, is what I was saying also about. Uh, uh, there's not much that we can do uh, in terms of. Um, creating success or failure that's that's not really in our hands what is in our hands is effort what we can do what we can do in the present but of course it's influenced by the past it's in it's influenced by all of our past actions all of our past causes create the future effects some of them are seen some of them are unseen some of them are drishta some of them are adrishta some are seen some are unseen so yes, there are there are there are factors that have nothing to do with our present uh, effort uh, that will play into the formula for it's like a kaleidoscope. You keep turning everything, and the few what it creates that is is all interrelated. So the law of karma is essentially mysterious. I should always say in the Gita, he says it's uh, gahana karmano gatihi. Which means that the direction of karma is is unfathomable, unknowable, because there's simply too many factors in the past. It's, it's like it's like planting a garden. You know, there's so many different seeds at different stages of growth. You don't know what's coming up. So we have actions that have created effect, some that haven't created effect yet. All that's going to go into the future result, which is a yet another reason to not be preoccupied with it, because in fact, it only makes you more present. You realize, look, all I actually have governance over, all that I can actually affect, that I can do anything about is my current effort. So just do it. Don't worry about the future. Let the past be gone. You'll have more energy. You'll have more peace in your actions. And whatever comes will come. And deal with that in that present moment. And then the next present moment. And then the next present moment. So that's all going on. The law of karma. That That's... To answer that piece, the other concept that you brought in, which is true, is that, and there's a number of levels of ways of looking at this, that I am not the doer. And you're right. The, the Gita says this constantly. And, and when we say that you are uh, surrendered to the self, when you say that I am focused on the self as I act, the personality is allowed to act like an actor on a stage. You play the roles that you're supposed to play. And the, if you take that highest uh, stance that I am the infinite consciousness, I am the Godhead, I am the transcendental, I am the totality, I am not this personality, then that will make you even more driven into the present, even more peaceful in the present. Because you're not involved and attached to the actions of Michael. You are watching Michael function. You are... Uh, aware of Michael functioning, Michael's doing his best, but you're not attached to it. That's the highest way of of employing the concept of I am not the doer into all this. A more relative way is to understand that 
I am only a small piece of my action. Like uh, James was mentioning, uh, Brian at at Airbnb. There's five thousand people running that thing. I doubt he knows, not, you know, ninety percent of what everybody's doing on a given day. He doesn't know. Uh, so if he says I am running Airbnb, he would be absurd. It would just be an absurd thing, and they would replace him. I mean, of course he's the he's the he's the bow of the ship. He's cutting through the ocean of uncertainty and blah blah blah. But he's not in he's not in the in the engine room and in the in the cafeteria of the ship and making all the beds and all those things are important to make the ship go right. Each one has their role to play. So this is yet another uh, way. All of these these different things that you bring up, uh, which which I I was alluding to earlier when I said that uh, we've got to use the intellect to apply the Vedantic values to our mind when we see it getting involved in the past and the future and the present and overexcited in the present. We've got to use the values of Vedanta. These are this is the knowledge of, of Vedanta that you start to apply into your action to make you less attached, less involved in the in the, the fruits, or less worried about what happened in the past. And you just get on with your action. So all of these these uh, concepts which you, you rightly bring up are uh, only uh, only help to achieve uh, this this ideal action that that we're talking about. Uh, you good with that, uh, Michael? Yeah, yeah, it's a great explanation. Thanks for that, Jay. Cool, thanks, man. Uh, anyone else uh, interested in a Q and A today? Anything on? this ideal action or anything else from any other stuff we've discussed. Got a, Go ahead, James. Yeah. I've got a question for you, Joseph, which is yesterday you and I were chatting about rights versus duties. Could you talk about the distinction between the two and, and which would be energy generating and which would be energy dissipating to think about and, you know, ruminate on. Yeah, sure. So it's, that's also another piece of uh, another tool in the Vedanta toolbox that um, if we employ will help relieve us of this um, of this dissipation of energy uh, that leads to fatigue you know if you if you approach your your work if you approach your relationships if you approach your your position in the community as with the idea of well, how can I serve? What are my duties? Uh, and, and this comes out of a recognition of the feast that we've all been feeding on since day one of our birth. I mean, going back to oxygen and sunlight and fresh water and, and um, you know, uh, whatever it is, everything just to keep us alive, barometric pressure. I mean, everything is so perfectly designed for us to live. Not to mention the mother's milk and all the people taking care of us and feeding us and educating us and protecting us. I mean, all of these things make us realize that, uh, as Prophet Muhammad said, the best amongst you are those who are best at repaying. The best amongst us are those who of us who are the best at repaying. So when we have an attitude of, what can I give? What can I, how can I serve? How can I be of use to this company? How can I be of use to this family, to this community, to this group of guys going surfing? Whatever it is, um, that in the, immediately removes our selfishness. It removes our, our egoistic approach to things. And that prevents this dissipation that we've been talking about this hour. Uh, if you're not selfish, you're not worried about what you did or didn't do last time. You're not worried about... Uh, holding on to what's going on in the present. You're not worried about whether people are going to notice you or not, or whether you're going to be successful or not. You're just interested in the larger, the larger society, whatever that is, the, the larger circle of identification in that we will find great peace. So that attitude of doing my duty, doing, uh, living a, a life of Dharma, a living a life of service and sacrifice is, uh, is the same thing that we've been talking about today versus my rights, mine. I, I deserve this. 
I'm, I have the right to this. I have the right to that. I've been working at this company for five years. You guys owe me this. You owe me that. I, you know, I've been married to you for two years. You owe me this. You owe me that. No, we should have the attitude of service and sacrifice. We will be peaceful. And then everyone says, yeah, but then what will happen to you if you don't look out for yourself? You'll be more peaceful. <laughs> Just serve. Continue to serve. And if you really do it, they'll make statues of you and your name will never be forgotten. You know? Uh, we're seeing it now. We were talking yesterday about this uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. If he's only concerned about himself, no one would know his name right now. He'd be hiding in Switzerland somewhere. Uh, like so many leaders that escape. That's not what he's doing. For better or for worse, whatever happens to him, his name will go down in history. Oh, but what if he dies, Joseph? Great, he'll evolve. He'll, he will have evolved tremendously as a human being. So duty gives peace. Duty gives success. Duty, an attitude of service and sacrifice, puts you right on top of your own life, your own, your own mental health, your own physical health, your spiritual health, and literally makes you uh, the successful person that you want to be in, in society because everybody appreciates that. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast of who do you think is more rested right now? And uh, hard to say that they'd be uh, use that word, but in that comparison, you have Putin on one hand, who probably feels the entire world's walls closing in, obviously with collapse of the economy and uh, record speed with every oligarch internationally uh probably pretty pissed off very different life they're living right now than they were 30 days ago and you have so you have someone with putin on one hand and someone like Zelensky on the other um one operating for more and one operating from a a, a place of of duty and and both under the same circumstances both have death uh looming and a collapse looming for them but you, i could imagine every time Zelensky speaks he gets energized every time putin tries to propagandize uh the agenda it is it probably takes a an additional toll oh for sure i mean you can see it yeah i, I don't think that uh you know Zelensky would describe it as a restful time of his life uh but all so many people that come come out of these um these kind of situations in retrospect they often say they miss it in fact i, I read a book about uh ptsd that made the argument that a lot of it is the, is the separation from purpose that's as much of the cause of, of the agitation of PTSD as much as it is the bombs falling and whatnot. It, it's that separation mm. from this sense of, of higher purpose, that sense of camaraderie, that sense of being part of something bigger than myself. And suddenly you're just, you know, a person on the street again. That is extremely hard to deal with. It makes it, you, a person loses their, their, their higher body, as it were. And becomes, uh, you know, um, limited and selfish and egoistic again. It's just one theory. I don't know. I mean, in one book I read. But from a Vedantic point of view, it makes sense. Zelensky might not say he's rested and peaceful. But deep down inside, I'm, I'm guessing. And you can tell by how he talks with the power and the clarity and, and the yeah, voice. Yeah, his power and clarity grows each day with, with the talks that he's giving. Right. It seems from the outside. Absolutely. Right. And so if if a person is scheming and, and, and hiding and stashing away their money and worried about what's going to happen to just their their stuff, there, there's there's no that's agitation. It's endless. It, it's stressful. It is the opposite of intense work is rest. But a person who gets inspired by a truly by having a higher goal, a higher mission, a higher vision, that is a different type of life. It's an ethereal air that people breathe that once you get it, it's almost an addiction, but it's a positive addiction. And you'll, you'll be willing to go into poverty. You'll be willing to be jailed. You'll be willing to put yourself in a, 
in in the in the crosshairs of massive armies because you have ex- you're experiencing something transcendent and it doesn't have to be the transcendental if it is that's great there's no power like the truth and divinity that's the highest but even if it's just i'm part of this uh, this movement i'm part of this cause once you get a taste for that selfish egoistic living is insipid is so feels so limited you'll never want to go back to that you never you never will go back to that it's it's a downgrade of life so yeah it's a it's a great example uh any other questions anybody uh anything we've been talking about here or I'll any or in the early david, david david marcus just added that putin uh-huh. has krishna's armies but Zelensky has, Zelensky has krishna nice one david Cheers. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to jump to dad duty here. Okay, man. 8 a.m. Is that, is that time for me? But, um, right. I got a potentially first time clubhouse. And... <laughs> hi, Jamal. Uh, Jamal, do you have a question? Hi, hi. Hi. You, you have a question, Jamal? Huh? Yeah, I was just going to leave with with one last question on this topic, which is sure. the again getting back to the practical. Um, what can we do this Friday morning? To one of the thoughts that comes through my mind of the practicality is l- lean in, find the areas of un that uh, those unknowns in our lives in our work, and yeah. and devote a little bit of work in in that direction and see what happens for three weeks. Just, I heard someone recently tweet is a great tweet of we'd rather choose death over uncertainty. And it's, it's so true. I have built businesses where I'm like, I just, I'd rather sell now and have certainty than live in this limbo. Um, And, and yeah, it's perhaps something pragmatic for any of us would be over the next three weeks lean into that unknown where you have no idea by definition and you don't expect anything to come back to you for a new initiative. Um, but you know, it's in accordance with a higher ideal and, and then just in that self-science approach, see if you do see, uh, if you see this, this flow and this energy generation come from, you know, the tiniest of, of initiatives you take on that are in the direction of the unknown. Do you have any other pragmatic, take this into your Friday type of um, type of words for this topic of, of turning intense work into, into rejuvenation like rest? Yeah, I mean, just to take it all the way back to the most practical thing, which is to re- understand and remember, I have a mind, I have an intellect. My mind is flowy. It has no direction. It, it goes into the past. It gets overexcited, involved in the present. It, it wanders into the future. This is the nature of the mind. And I don't want to be a victim of my mind. I don't want to be a slave to my mind. I want to use my intellect to hold my mind on my chosen action. First step is to understand that. And I would say, write it down. I have a mind. I have an intellect. Define it as best you can. Uh, as we talk about a lot, there's a number of resources to remember and understand the mind and intellect. Fall of the Human Intellect is a great starting point. A book by Swamiji, uh, Swami Parthasarati, um, that describes in depth what's the mind, what's the intellect. But if you understand what the mind is, it's the water in the river. It has no form, no direction. If you don't give it a direction, it will wander into the past, wander into the future, sap your energy, and make your work tiresome. Whereas if you have an intellect, you'll be able to focus on what you're doing and hopefully something slightly unselfish as your motive. This is the basic thing going on in this discussion today. And it's the, it's actually the end of it also. It's the main point. Everything else is supporting that. Um, so I would, I would write down, I have a mind, I have an intellect, put it on a post-it note and stare at it every now and then at your desk or your bathroom mirror or your laptop or whatever you're doing. Amen. Amen. Okay. Off to dad duty. Thank you everybody for joining. And if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to 
to chat with Joseph for a few minutes here and we'll see everybody next Friday, 7 a.m. And then check out, we just released a great episode uh, for uh, the podcast and on YouTube. Go to yfyi.co to check it out and look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks, James. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, All right, buddy. And any questions before we sign off today? We have another, we could do another 10 minutes or so if anyone has any questions or we can all go our own ways, whatever you prefer. There was someone who tried to come up, uh, uh, David Marcus. Let's see if it works. David, welcome. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much. I I love uh, the content and this is just uh, really awesome. Thanks for contributing this. you know, I kind of feel like you've already sort of given a really good answer to this question, but I, you know, I, I wanted to get your take on sort of how one might work on listening to their intuition. And, you know, when you're, when you're making decisions in your life, how you really, how you channel your intellect towards, you know, the, the right decision. And I, and I think that you mentioned service and I think James's answer about leaning into the own unknown was great, but I just wonder if you have any other comments on intuition and how we access that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, intuition is a, um, result of, uh, repeated, um, experience or thinking or conclusions in a, in a particular direction. I'll give you an example, surfing. Um, if I go to a new spot in somewhere in the world to go surf, um, I'm really I don't have much into intuition about where the wave's going to be. I don't know. I have to really watch and ask locals and kind of try it out. And I'm usually not that good. But if I paddle out here in Malibu in spots that I've surfed for ten years, I can tell you, hey, just uh, David, you know, paddle over there a little bit, a little bit over there, you'll get the wave you want. And you'll be like, how are you doing this? Are you like magic? No, there's no magic in it. It's just 10,000 times I've sat there and done it. And that that conclusion of past experience, past thinking, past understanding, uh, that is intuition. Intuition is not some uh, magical thing that comes from heaven. You know, it's, it's a result of tremendous amount of past work that's been done that is now uh, basically like, uh, mental muscle memory, right? And so your intellect can be aware that, hey, look, I, I just know. And the, it, the thing is, the intellect should always be in the game. So the <laughs> intellect can, can understand, okay, in this area, I've just got it. I have an intuitive sense that just comes from my past efforts that this is the thing to do or this is the thing to not do or this is the place to go or not go or whatever. I just know. And you, your intellect may not bother to understand why do I know this? And and as I said, uh, like to Michael earlier, a lot of these effects are are not seen. You may have intuition that comes from past lives also, things that you just know. And so it seems like it's just coming from the universe or whatever kind of uh, mystical stuff people say. It's actually your past effort that has created in you a practiced understanding in a particular direction or field of activity or what have you. But the intellect should still analyze and say, okay, my intuition is guiding me in this direction. Uh, Should I go along with it or not? And if you're really sure, do it. But the intellect should still call the shots, uh, if that makes sense, David. That sounds great. That's a great answer. Thank you for that insight. Cool. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Uh, someone else uh, just invited. You have anything else, David? Are you good? No, that's great. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, sure thing. Uh, there was one more person raised their hand. Uh, let's see if they're coming up. Okay, any other questions, folks? Anything Vedanta related or otherwise? Okay, well, it's been a good one. In a good hour and a half today. Ah, there's somebody, Evgeny. Let's see if we can bring Evgeny up. Up oh, says you can't join right now, Evgeny. I don't know why. 
So we'll wrap it up for today. And uh, thank you all so much. Uh, please follow us, follow the club. Uh, and um, we will see you all next Friday with another topic. Not sure what it is yet. And for more from James and I, uh, please check out yfyi.co. Go to YouTube. Subscribe to our stuff there. Uh, like it. Do all that stuff that you're always asked to do. And um, we look forward to seeing you here again. I'll leave the room open for a few more minutes so everybody can follow and whatnot. And um, we'll see you next week. Hariom, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>